Hello, I'm Jay Shadler. Our first story from 1998 explores the mystery surrounding the murder of a woman in a Spokane, Washington park. The case received extra attention in the community because the victim's husband was a well-respected member of the sheriff's department. It was a cold night in November 1996 when Deputy Sheriff Tom DiBartolo and his wife Patty took a walk in the park where they'd had their first date 19 years earlier. As they watched the lights of Spokane shimmering below, she had no idea this would be their last night together. Spokane has always been a pretty nice city. That's always been a pretty nice little park. Um, these guys didn't know I was a cop. It's not supposed to happen to us. We're the good guys. He was more than a good guy. He was a hero. Go. Looking good, looking yeah. good. Tom DiBartolo was part of the sheriff's department search and rescue team. A news crew was there when he jumped into the freezing current without a lifeline to rescue a two-year-old girl. Go, 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 go. So it was even more stunning to the public when this seasoned lawman recounted what happened that night when he and his wife got to the park. Decided to go for a walk, uh, got out there. Uh, stood for a few moments and uh, received a page from home. Something was going on at home. Let's go back and make a phone call, see what's going on. DiBartolo said that when they got back to their van, two strangers accosted him. Got approached by a gentleman uh, asking for money. Uh, when I addressed him, I was struck from the rear, knocked to the ground. He says one of the assailants then reached into the van in the glove compartment and came up with his wife's gun. Struggled with him. There was a shot that went off and struggled with him. And uh, another shot went off. That's the shot that hit me. Although wounded in his side, DiBartolo says he went after the gunman as they fled. A bullet hole in a nearby tree is a grisly reminder of his response. Got my gun out of the car. And tried to fire at them. And turned back, called for her, and just looked, and she wasn't there. Tell me what happened when you realized your wife was hit. I, I had no idea she had been shot at that point. I got rid of my gun. I stepped over the top of her, uh, you know, shook her a little bit, tried to figure out, you know, you know, Patty Patty talked to me. She didn't respond to me. 911, state emergency. Tom loaded the body of his motionless wife, Patty, into the van and headed back to town. He used the car phone to call 911. What do you need? I've been shot. You've been shot? Yeah. Okay, my wife has been shot. And I've been shot. We were in the park. Is the shooter there, sir? No, they're Is the, Okay, stay on the line with me, sir. Tom's arrival at Sacred Heart Hospital was recorded by security cameras. Doctors tried to save Patty, but it was too late. Tom was admitted for his gunshot wound to the abdomen and rushed to surgery. When police arrived, he said his assailants were two young black men, and he said he got enough of a view of one of them to provide a description for a police artist. A law enforcement officer had been shot. Uh, his wife had been murdered. We've got to pull out all the stops. So we've got to snag these perpetrators as rapidly as we can. Police Chief Terry Mangan arrived at the park less than an hour after the first shots were fired. He supervised the police investigation as officers combed the crime scene. The search began for the man who had shot a hero and killed his wife, the mother of five children. Within days, Deputy Sheriff DiBartolo took his grief public, appealing to a shocked Spokane for help in finding his wife's killers. She was your mom. You can take that to your heart and just know that if you feel about your mom how you do, then she was your mom. I encourage anybody that knows anything about this situation to, you know, to come across. Meanwhile, the manhunt went on as agents from the police and the sheriff's department searched for evidence and followed up leads provided by Tom DiBartolo. But as the investigation continued, the man who was complaining the loudest, the grieving husband who'd been wounded himself, was gradually turning into a suspect. Several of those involved in the case told us that his story of what happened here at Lincoln Park that night just didn't add up. There were some, some alarm bells going off here. Um, why you would take your wife for a walk in this kind of a park and not arm yourself and leave your weapon in your, in your vehicle um, didn't make much sense to us. Police were so suspicious that within a month they set up surveillance on DiBartolo. But why? What might motivate a decorated law enforcement officer to kill his wife and injure himself? Why would he concoct such a tale? One possibility became evident just hours after Tom came out of surgery. 
He was transferred to a room on the fourth floor at Sacred Heart Hospital, where nurse Judith Edmonds was on duty. And I went back into the room to check on his IVs and to see how he was doing, if he needed anything. And I observed a female bending over his bed, kissing him. I always had suspicions on him having affairs. Michelle, 21, is Patty's daughter from her first marriage. And although she considered Tom more of a father than stepfather, she had heard the truth from her mother. She had talked to me about him having affairs ever since prior to them even getting married. And, um, well, knew that he uh, was having an affair with at least three people that she knew of. Three people at the same time? Mm-hmm. Did you have any idea that anybody suspected you? There's no reason anybody should have suspected me. There's no reason at all they should have suspected me at all. I didn't do this thing. You know, I didn't know if he had done it himself or he paid somebody to do it or what he did, but I just knew that he had some involvement in it. Michelle says she was suspicious from the beginning, but it took a week or so for Di Bartolo's 19-year-old son, Nick, to wonder why his dad was showing no remorse. I was just thinking, you know, what kind of guy can lose his wife and go out with his friends and do whatever, you know, the next day. Imagine Nick's situation, suspecting his father was a murderer, then taking that information to police. After three months, Police brought Tom DiBartolo in for an eight-hour interrogation. He became the focus and the primary suspect. And during the course of that interview, we actually did go and request a warrant and got a warrant signed by the judge. On January 29, 1997, Deputy Sheriff Tom DiBartolo was arrested and charged with first-degree premeditated murder of Patty DiBartolo, his wife of 19 years and the mother of his five children. When we return, Tom DiBartolo on trial, next on Justice Files. <music> Deputy Sheriff Tom DiBartolo had been arrested and charged with the murder of his wife, Patty. The emotional case against a once popular man would be argued before a jury of his peers. The arrest of Deputy Sheriff Tom DiBartolo sent a collective shiver through most of Spokane. They could not connect the charge of murder with this familiar face, the hero who'd gone on the news to promote water safety. And your chances of survival in water like, like we have running in our river right now are very slim. The upcoming trial was all anyone talked about, especially the buzz about the women in DiBartolo's life. Numerous different partners with whom he'd had affairs while he was married to his wife, Patty. Much of the attention focused on this woman, Christine Ritchie, the tall blonde seen kissing Di Bartolo at the hospital just hours after his wife's murder. She did not appear to be family, and the kiss was much too long to be a family kiss, so I thought it was kind of strange. Di Bartolo was not permitted to see Ritchie, one of the conditions of bail that also kept him from a total of 27 prospective witnesses, including his children, Michelle and Nick. But here he is captured by police video cameras, clearly violating the court order with Christine. Di Bartolo was rearrested and remained in jail until his trial. The issue of Di Bartolo's involvement would be left to the jury. A year and three days after the murder of Patty Di Bartolo, they heard opening arguments in the case of the state of Washington versus Thomas Anthony Di Bartolo. This case is about selfishness, extramarital affairs, money. It's about divorce, deception, and deceit. James Sweetser was chief prosecutor. The evidence will show that the plan was to make the murder look like a robbery, to blame the murder on two young black males wearing baggy clothes. The prosecution started with motive zeroing in on Tom's extramarital affairs. As it turns out, he readily admitted to them. But by taking the stand, which the law did not require him to do, DiBartolo opened himself up to a brutal barrage. 
question. Assistant Prosecutor Larry Steinmetz reminded jurors of De Bartolo's dead wife. Was she happy with you having sex with Christine Ritchie? I don't believe she knew that, sir. Was she happy with you having sex with Joanne Walker? I don't believe she knew that either, sir. Was she happy with you having sex with your other girlfriends? I don't believe she knew other than a few. I don't believe she knew. In fact, the very day of Patty DiBartolo's murder, Tom DiBartolo visited his girlfriend, Christine Ritchie. What'd you do at Christine Ritchie's house? Talked. Um, played with the dog. Had sex. It was later that evening that Tom D. Bartolo took his wife for the fatal drive to Lincoln Park, a place they'd apparently visited often in the weeks leading up to the murder. He had been planning the murder of his wife since October 12, 1996, by taking her to the park around the same time of night, 9 p.m., to reduce the risk of getting caught around shift change to allow plenty of time for his wife to die. Exactly how Patty DiBartolo did die became a central part of the prosecution's case. He had to explain why these suspects would have basically executed Patty, and he only got a superficial gunshot wound. Sir, why is it that your wife received an executionary style bullet to the back of her head? I grabbed his hand. The gun went off. Executionary style. I wouldn't call it that. I said the gun went off. A cardboard model of his van was set up in the courtroom. So Di Bartolo could explain how he was shot while trying to take the gun away from his assailants. I was scared to death. This guy had already shot once and I was hanging on fighting for my life. He told the jury that in the struggle with the gunman, he bent over and twisted his arm. And the gun is now in an upside down position. The defendant demonstrated to detectives three times that when he employed the gun takeaway technique, that the gun was upside down when it discharged. But the ballistics test showed from the markings on the shirt and the markings on, an ab on his abdomen that the gun had to be right side up. Isn't it true, sir, you shot yourself to give yourself credibility? No, sir, it's not. The next item was timing. Di Bartolo's wife had been shot in the head and was bleeding profusely. Why did it take so long to get her to the hospital? The park is only two miles from Sacred Heart Hospital. Even if the defendant was traveling at a speed of only 40 miles an hour, he would be there in three minutes. When Patty Di Bartolo was brought in, she was received in the emergency room by Dr. Stephen Penaskovic. I estimated that her... her uh time of death occurred uh, between 30 and 45 minutes before I saw her. Still, police observe that just one month after his wife's death, Di Bartolo was spending large amounts of time with Christine Ritchie and repeatedly asking to be taken off the suspect list so he could collect Patty's life insurance money. Did you shoot her for insurance money? No, I did not shoot my wife. For did any you reason. shoot your wife in the back of the head to get out of paying child support? No, I did not. From the beginning, defense attorney Marianne Moreno cast her client as a victim of police bias. The detectives sunk their teeth into the foibles of Tom DiBartolo like pit bulls, and they didn't let go. Uh, Mr. DiBartolo, please don't be sworn, please. But it wasn't just police who suspected him. In a devastating affront to the man who had raised them, two of Tom DiBartolo's kids testified against him. Nothing but the truth, so help you God. Yes. And what did... If anything, did your father ask you about in regards to law enforcement? Um, he'd asked if I had talked to any detectives or if anybody tried to talk to me. And what, if anything, did he tell you if you were contacted? Uh, to watch what I say. It was very, very intimidating. It, it's real tough to do that. Why did you do it? I felt that was what was right. I knew I'd have dreams, and uh, actually my mother would actually talk to me and tell me that I needed to do what I thought was right. So I did. Yeah. When I was up on the stand, I felt like I was speaking for him. Mr. DiBartolo is guilty of many things. <coughs> He's 
guilty of not being a good husband, guilty of not being the best father, it would require an enormous leap of faith to find him guilty of the murder of his wife. My wife's been shot. I'm bringing her into the hospital. I need the police. Now it was up to the jury. Was the man on the stand, or his voice on the 911 tape, crying for help or covering up the murder of his wife? I'll put the sheriff's office, man. Have you reached a verdict? Yes, we have. Mr. DiBartolo, would you stand, please? We, the jury, find the defendant, Thomas Anthony DiBartolo, guilty of the crime of murder in the first degree. He thought he was so smart that he'd be beyond suspicion as a law enforcement officer that he could commit the perfect crime. As for Tom DiBartolo, he continues to maintain his innocence. The people that did this are still out there. The people that killed Patty are still out there. They bit into me and they held on to me. That's all they've done. There's no way I killed Patty. Tom DiBartolo was sentenced to 26 years in prison for murdering his wife, Patty. In February 1998, a Superior Court judge denied his request for a new trial. And in 1999, DiBartolo's attorney planned another appeal. While troubled marriages rarely end in murder, domestic violence is one of the most frequently reported crimes in the country. Since many victims decline to press charges against their husbands or boyfriends, it is nearly impossible to prosecute many cases of domestic violence. In response, one police department came up with an innovative solution. In the late 1990s, domestic violence was a priority call for San Diego police, as it was for police departments around the country. He grabs around the face uh -huh. and, and puts my head way back. But what really set San Diego apart was the attention prosecutors gave domestic violence cases in court. He grabbed my arm. They pursued the smallest offense and prosecuted cases even if the victims did not want to press charges. I didn't want charges because... I felt that he had never threatened my life. You're being politically correct if you're letting them make the decision, when in fact what you're doing is you're putting them in more danger than they have ever been before, and you're drawing a target right in the middle of their chest. As of 1999, San Diego prosecutors had tried 70% of the city's domestic violence cases without the victim's assistance, and won almost three-quarters of them. That's because they backed up their decision to prosecute with improved police work. Polaroid cameras to document injuries and special forms. It's a checklist to make sure that we have everything that we need for the report for, for better prosecution. Domestic violence is on good morning. And to follow up, a 27-member detective unit and 11 prosecutors. We, the jury in the above entitled cause, find the defendant, Thomas Allen Valley, guilty of the violation of sex. With a successful prosecution, the homicides are dramatically going down. And, and that, if that isn't proof that it works here in San Diego, I don't know what is. Male and female screaming at each other, small juvenile crying. By pursuing batterers without the victim's cooperation, prosecutors break the cycle of violence and, most important, are trying to protect victims from future harm. A Hollywood marriage transformed into a murder-suicide. Coming up on Justice Files. Two officers are under investigation inside the Fulton County Jail. Comedian Phil Hartman became nationally known as a featured player on Saturday Night Live, and he went on to high-profile work in sitcoms and movies. At home, Hartman raised two children with his wife, Bryn. But as our next report from 1999 explores, it all ended very suddenly when he was shot and killed by Bryn who then committed suicide. This is a little monkey. She burned yet. Hey, Sean, look. You're on TV! Oh, this is Harvin, sir. Right in the camera, yeah. We look closely, as if a clue can be found in the volumes of photo albums the home movies of birthdays and Christmases past, 
The boxes of love letters they wrote to each other for over 10 years. It is their life in their own words and pictures, as Bryn and Phil Hartman saw each other and themselves. Bryn, at age 40, was a beautiful wife and stay-at-home mother. The day she died, in her purse was a check she had just written to join Screen Actors Guild, the first official step in forging an acting career of her own. When he died at almost age 50, Phil Hartman's career was still on the rise. But there was a homebody side of Phil as well, the man who relished being a dad. Watch as Phil Hartman hones his impersonating skills on his young son and listen to a last interview just weeks before the end. What makes me the happiest? Well, without question, it's being a father. And also, my wife and I are reaping the rewards, I think, of good parenting. I more live in an attitude of gratitude that I seem to be blessed beyond measure. Which makes that final day, May 28th, 1998, all the more jarring, all the more puzzling. At 6 o'clock in the morning, police are called to this house in Encino, California. A SWAT team responds. Inside, Phil Hartman lay dead. With him in the bedroom, behind a locked door, is Bryn. She has just turned the gun on herself, leaving behind their two small children. I cannot, in my wildest imagination, envision any scenario where she, she would have done that, ever. My mind was just scrambling for any possible cause. I couldn't, there was nothing that came to me. Phil and Bryn were married on November 25th, 1987. From the beginning, the Hartmans were a down-to-earth couple in a star-studded industry. What Bryn made a point of reaching out to friends to include others. Bryn be extended herself to me. She was more the instigator in our friendship. I mean, she really included me and called me and invited me and was all made sure that I was part of the group. They were just very open people, very approachable. Live from West Hollywood, it's baby shower. And friends like Marcy responded. She and her sister Judy threw Bryn's first baby shower in 1988. Oh. Home videos show a glowing Bryn surrounded by girlfriends. As a young mom, she documented the smallest details with hours of home videos. Baby books filled with tender moments for Phil, like baby laughed hysterically for daddy. Even Sean's first case of the sniffles. Sean has his first cold. No fun. She really wanted everybody around her to be happy. She was the most fun person that I ever met. They were all natural comedians, the whole family, all four of them. This film is in Elephanto Vision, the only film shot from the point of view of an elephant. Family seemed to be important to both partners, but friends say Phil's success in his career was beginning to take its toll. Bryn began complaining to friends about the demands on Phil's time. What would be a typical complaint? Well, he's working long hours. Like, <laughs> he's working so much. Did you ever see them fight? Not very often. Not a real blown out fight. I've seen them argue a couple of times, but nothing more than either low voices or stern talk, but nothing outlandish. At this point, Bryn was having a tough time of her own. She had recently turned 40, and to her friends, she seemed to be searching for something more. She hit the 40 and she started to think, and yeah, you think about heavy issues in life. So but what were those difficult issues I she was tackling? Well, being a mom, having postponed a career, um, having dedicated herself to her husband and family, wondering what she could have done, wondering where she could be by now. Bryn once again began to pursue a career of her own in acting and modeling, but she was finding it difficult to break in. There were clear signs that Bryn's frustration was building. Friends say after years of being clean and sober, Bryn began drinking socially again. More ominous, she had a serious slip with cocaine on Mother's Day of 1997. Friends and family members say it was her first slip in a decade. They also say it was Phil, who at 6 o'clock the next morning began making arrangements to get Bryn back into rehab. Bryn checked into this Arizona rehab clinic, but according to friends and family, she stayed less than a week because she missed her children. I mean, I had an idea about the drug problems. I mean, she told me about that, but um, it seemed really in the past. It really seemed like she had pulled it together. 
According to the girlfriend Bryn met at this restaurant her last evening, Bryn seemed restless. In the last year and a half of her life, she had tried three different antidepressants. Sometime after 10 p.m., she visited an old friend, Ron Douglas. At some point that night, Bryn used cocaine and appeared to consume more alcohol. Police believe she returned home around 1 a.m., where she put on a pair of white cotton gap pajamas, took off her wedding rings, took a gun out of a locked safe, and shot her husband three times. I heard the phone ring, and my husband answered the phone, and he came in and said, um, he was like, white as a ghost, and I said, what's wrong? And he said, well, Bryn just called. She's hysterical. I can barely understand it. Something Phil is dead, or she thinks Phil is dead. She needs you. Fifteen minutes earlier, Bryn had called Marcy Tosher's sister, Judy, who barely recognized Bryn's voice. And she, she was obviously calling from her car phone, so she said, where are you? And Bryn, I don't know. I don't know where I am. Friends say, and police reports confirm, that after shooting Phil, Bryn returned to Ron Douglas's home, where she arrived hysterical, saying that she thought she shot Phil. A few hours later, Douglas followed her back to her house in his car. It was maybe like a blackout or something, and she really didn't know. And so she had Ron go with her to tell her to, to, to either validate what she thinks she had done or seen or whatever, or to disprove it and say it was a nightmare. This was Ron Douglas's call to 911 from the Hartman home shortly after 6 a.m. There's been a shooting at 5065 Encino Boulevard. What's up? How many people just shot? Uh, just one. Is this on purpose or is this an accident or what? I have Do you know no what idea. happened? I have no idea. She said she had killed her husband. I didn't believe her. Marcy says it was 620 when she and her husband arrived at the Hartman house. And then the next thing I know, um, all of these policemen are running up to the house and they have like their um, SWAT gear. So I thought... This, some, this is really not good. Something is really bad. And they pull us away from the house. The police handed the two children off to Marcy and her husband, who ushered them to safety. Inside, Bryn had locked herself in the bedroom where Phil lay dead. Bryn had already called her sister with a message for the kids. Marcy remembers it as this. Tell my kids that I, I love them more than anything, and I always love them, and... Um, Mommy doesn't know what happened, and she's just very sorry. And that's what she told her. Moments after that phone call, Bryn turned the gun on herself. When high-profile cases of celebrities in crisis make headlines, it often helps turn attention to serious problems thousands of couples struggle with every day. In 1994, as the media swarmed around the O.J. Simpson trial, public concern was raised about the issue of domestic violence. On a day when a routine hearing for a not-so-routine defendant attracted a record crowd of reporters to the L.A. Criminal Courts building... Call the screen a case. Just across the street, in the domestic violence unit of the DA's office, Lydia Bowden started her routine, unrelenting and unheralded. Okay, relationship to victim? Any weapon used? In just over an hour, in the time it took for the satellite trucks to set up across the street, Bowden received 20 new felony complaints of domestic violence. This place is like a, I'm telling you, this is like a mass unit every single day. There are days when I am running like down the halls so that I can make sure that I can get my phone fast enough. Hi, this is Lydia. When not listening to complaints over the phone, Bowden was reviewing them over her desk, where a picture is worth a thousand police reports. This goes all the way around the neck, and it peaks at the back like someone strangled. Yeah. Yeah. Telephone cord did it. Telephone cords laying underneath the, uh, the body. They suspected the woman's husband, but didn't have enough to hold him. This guy's loose. We had to release him yesterday. Yeah. She told him to gather more evidence and moved on to the next gruesome case. Okay, next. And the next set of gruesome photos. In this case, a woman's breast was almost severed in the attack. There's not a single day that goes by in this business that I'm not offended by the kinds of crimes that go on behind closed doors. It makes me sick. Lawyers caught in the sometimes deadly crosshairs of domestic disputes. Next on Justice Files. Our next story from 1998 investigates the reality facing divorced lawyers who become involved in intimate and emotional disputes between husbands and wives. Some of these attorneys might be risking their lives. 
It never occurred to me that his life was in at stake. Greenville, Illinois. Thomas Meyer, 66, shot to death outside his office. 911 emergency, what are you reporting? Please, please, my office is shot. Orange County, California. Ronald Weiss, 62, murdered just inches from his desk. They spent their time in rooms like this representing clients because they are or were attorneys. But these men weren't attacked representing hardened criminals. Each of them was shot handling a divorce case. This area of law is the most dangerous you could be in because you're dealing with raw human emotions. Celebrity divorce attorney Ralph Felder says the violence, unfortunately, doesn't surprise him. I was a federal prosecutor and I prosecuted organized crime. These are the worst criminals in the world. Uh, and I, I got less threats when I was prosecuting organized criminals than I did when I was in the divorce practice. That 911 phone call recorded in Orange County, California, came just minutes after attorney Ron Weiss was shot by his client's ex-husband, Roger Sandsmark. Sandsmark barged into Weiss's office screaming his name, according to his secretary of 27 years, Jenny Solden. He was just totally focused on Ron. And then all of a sudden, he um, pulled out a gun. Ron actually went like this in front of his face with his, put hands. his hands up. He put his hands up and he says, Mr. Sandsmark, think about what you're about to do. Let's think this through. Let's think this over. And I think when he said that about three times, Mr. Sandsmark shot him. He, did, he just, and, and the gun went off. And Ron screamed so loud. When he screamed that loud scream, I'll never forget it, I started running down the hall. And the gun all the time was going off. With the last bullet he fired, Sandsmark took his own life. Ron Weiss was dead. According to Jenny Sulden and attorney Stuart Knight, who shared an office with him, all the bloodshed seemed to be triggered simply by money. Mr. Sandsmark was really quite adamant about his wife not having any part of his pension. He, um, he did not want that to happen. Attorney Weiss had won a share of Sandsmark's pension money for his ex-wife. But we're not talking about a large amount of money no. involved in Mrs. Sandsmark's interest. You're talking magnitudes of, of $3,000 and perhaps the differences could come down to less than $1,000 on this thing. And, and that's, that's where we are. Why, and that, that's why I said it's totally irrational. Children can raise the emotional stakes even higher as they did here in Greenville, Illinois. Kelly McGinnis was married for 12 years and had two young children when his wife filed for divorce. A bitter custody dispute followed. Attorney Larry Lefevre represented McGinnis. I thought he was a good father. I think if you met him, you'd have probably liked him all right. He was, he was a little bit withdrawn, but there was nothing about him that would uh, immediately um, make you dislike him or, or fear him. But after McGinnis lost custody of his children, he fired Lefevre and waged his own battle against everyone involved in the case. Judge Ann Callis presided over the divorce and made the custody ruling. After the ruling came down, he was saying that the court, all of us, court reporter included, colluded together and uh, changed the transcripts to make him look bad. Did you? Absolutely not. There's no reason for four or five people to get together and collude against one man. So I think that's indicative of his state of mind. Callis says McGinnis's anger soon turned into irrational acts. He started stalking her to talk about the decision. His behavior became a little bit more bizarre where he'd come to the courthouse. He seemed to always know when I was there. But no one imagined how far McGinnis would go. Nearly five months after the custody ruling, he again went to the state's attorney's office, complaining about corruption in his case. Nearly two hours later, he waited outside the office of Tom Meyer, his ex-wife's attorney. When Meyer left work to go home, McGinnis shot him dead. As the killer fled, police told Callis and Lefevre that now their lives were also in danger. I was probably near hysterical because I thought I was going to be killed in front of my children. They indicated to me they thought he was on his way to, to kill me. Judge Callis went into hiding, and so ultimately did attorney Larry Lefevre. I stayed at uh, 
about five different places, including my own house. Um, when I got in the house, I would grab the shotgun and walk around with it. If I went outside, I'd put on a bulletproof vest. So yeah, there was some fear. Kelly McGinnis became the target of a national manhunt and riveted the public with letters to the local media accusing the court of, among other things, bias against fathers. After 86 days on the run, he showed up at Larry Lefevre's office carrying a shotgun. He calmly entered through the back door, walked past the secretary's desk and up the back stairway to the second floor. There, he made his way down the hallway to Lefevre's office. When he reached the entrance, he opened fire. Luckily, Lefevre was still in hiding and no one was injured. When you heard that he had been at this office and shot up your office, what was your reaction? I consider the people I work with a uh, part of my family. And to put these people at that kind of risk, uh, it just made me really angry. Do you believe what he did was an attack on the entire system or an attack on you and Mr. Meyer uh, and the judge personally? I think it was an attack on the entire system. And I think he felt his way to attack the system uh, was uh, selected assassinations. So he just couldn't accept what was handed down? He couldn't accept the fact that someone would divorce him, could divorce him. And did? And did divorce him. That's correct. McGinnis was arrested and pled guilty to Meyer's murder. He is now serving 70 years in prison and refused our request for an interview. For many divorced couples, having to talk with one another, let alone being in the same room together, is just about unthinkable. But what leads couples down the road to divorce? Attempts at predicting which marriages will fall apart usually prove futile. Who knows of any legal reason why this couple should not be married? But in 1999, one psychologist claimed he was closing in on some answers. At the University of Washington, this professor of psychology has spent years studying what he calls the masters and disasters of marriage. What makes them work, what tears them apart. The important thing is how you work as a team. John Gottman said he had it down to such a precise science, he could predict with more than 90% accuracy which couples would end up getting divorced. It all started with a classified ad for volunteer couples. For 13 years, more than 3,000 responded, and more than 800 couples participated in Gottman's studies. Sounds like he feels kind of betrayed. <laughs> Gottman and his wife, Julie, also a psychologist, observed the selected subjects as they were asked to talk about their relationships. Why would you take care of me? At the same time, electrodes, monitors, and video cameras recorded their facial expressions, their heart rates, even drops of sweat. Allegedly, the collection of scientific data could indicate early warning signs of emotional trouble down the road. In the very first three minutes, just the way a couple brings up an issue, whether they do it in a softened way, a gentle way, or in a harsh way, makes all the difference. In a study on newlyweds, couples were observed overnight in a fabricated apartment affectionately called the Love Lab, where Gottman gave them small assignments like building a paper tower to see how they interacted. In our apartment laboratory where couples live for 24 hours, the people are always making these bids for connection, and there are 70 in 10 minutes in marriages that are working well. And then we look at whether people turn away or turn toward. In these very tiny moments that often seem very trivial, people either make an emotional connection and really build the friendship, the romance, the good sex, the passion in the marriage, is built in the mundane, in the very small moments. Don't mess that up too much, because we can use that too. Hi, Captain. The Gottmans interpreted the couple's reactions and then counseled them on how to keep their relationship strong or get get it back on track. In marriages that work well, people fix it. They have a, a conversation where they recover, they repair it. And we've discovered that the basis of effective repair is really the quality of the friendship between husband and wife. Till death do us part concludes the vows exchanged by millions of couples on their wedding day. But the words take on an eerie significance when the death of one partner comes at the hands of the other. My uh, father had um shot my mother twice in the chest and sat next to her and put the gun in his mouth and he killed himself. In 1998, Linda Sullivan shared her story with members of a support group who had lost their relatives to violent crime. Her father did show signs of suffering from depression, 
But why did he kill her mother? I don't have a clue. I don't know if it's because maybe he didn't think she could make it without him. He, she needed him. And I think it was an act of love. But experts say these crimes were most often acts of desperation. The incident with Linda Sullivan's parents was typical of the growing trend of homicide suicides among people age 55 and older. In 1999, Florida, with the largest population of elderly, also had the highest elderly homicide suicide rate in the country. At least half the deaths occurred among couples in which one spouse must care for the other who is physically or mentally ill. This group of older people at the Lyleman Senior Center in St. Petersburg, Florida, have had to care for six spouses. Most contemplated suicide. I thought how easy it would be to just give him an extra Coumadin and uh, his blood would get so thin then he would just die and then I would kill myself. Advocates for the elderly believe homicide suicides could be prevented if doctors, neighbors, and relatives concern themselves not just with the physical health of older people, but their mental well-being, too. A grieving daughter had this advice. You have to stay in contact with your mom and dad. You have to be in tune on how they're feeling, what changes are going on in their lives. The exchange of marriage vows brings with it a special legal status. So when conflicts arise, how do courts balance questions of love and law? Here's Professor Arthur Miller. The relationship between marriage and the law is a unique one. Marriages are licensed by the state. One of the reasons it's a matter of state policy is that rightly or wrongly, it was historically assumed that a married couple was a stable unit and society should consist of stable units. In other words, there was a social policy to support the legal entity of marriage. The marriage contract is a civil contract, and if one person wants to breach a contract, he or she breaches it and the other side decides whether to sue for damages. The law has backed way off in enforcing the marriage vows on subjects like adultery and alienation of affection, which used to be both civil and criminal wrong although in many states adultery is still technically a crime. Shooting your spouse's paramour or shooting your spouse when caught with a paramour historically was treated a little more leniently in the courts than other acts of homicide. And even today there is still some notion that this type of murder isn't premeditated. It's more like murder in the second degree or manslaughter, a crime of passion, an irresistible impulse. But that's changing. After all, a life is a life. I'm Jay Shadler. Thanks for being with us. Join us again as we look behind the headlines at crime, punishment, and the law on the next edition of Justice Files.